What can we do to reverse global warming? Become aware of the solutions and think about the actions you can take as you listen to how we are drawing down in Pennsylvania. The first sentence of the first chapter of the fourth National Climate Assessment gets right to the point. Earth's climate is now changing faster than at any point in the history of modern civilization, primarily as a result of human activities. The chapter continues with reporting that climate change is transforming where and how we live and presents growing challenges to human health and quality of life, the economy, and the natural systems that support us. Risks posed by climate variability and change vary by region and sector and by the vulnerability of people experiencing impacts. Social, economic, and geographic factors shape the exposure of people and communities to climate-related impacts and the capacity to respond. And what do everyday people think about this? When it comes to opinions about global warming, the Yale Climate Change Communication Program reported in March 2018 that in the United States, 73% of adults believe global warming is happening, and 59% of the respondents believe that global warming is already harming people in the United States. 57% believe that global warming is caused mostly by human activities, and 65% believe that citizens should do more to address global warming. There's a community of scientists, policymakers, businesses, and more that is working to not just reduce global warming, but taking the bold and necessary steps to reverse global warming. In essence, to draw down the level of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Meet Dr. Katherine Wilkinson. She's the vice president of Project Drawdown, an organization that has generated a list of climate solutions with the greatest potential to reduce emissions or sequester carbon from the atmosphere. Project Drawdown is a nonprofit that really tries to be a trusted source for information and resources about climate solutions. And I also hope sort of a keeper of possibility in the face of the climate crisis. Our team did a really groundbreaking assessment of the practices and technologies that we already have in hand to help us address emissions and actually hopefully turn this situation around. And then we do a lot of work to educate and inform through books, TED Talks, et cetera, et cetera, about the solutions that we have to tackle climate change. So I joined the team back in early 2016 to work on writing the book, Draw Down, the most comprehensive plan ever proposed to reverse global warming, which we published in the spring of 2017. And then I've continued to lead our work around communication, editorial, creative. I do a lot of speaking and media and generally shaping our message and carrying it out to the world. Dr. Tom Richard is a professor of agricultural and biological engineering and director of the Institutes of Energy and the Environment at Penn State University. He shares why reversing global warming is so important in the state of Pennsylvania and what may happen if we chose not to address it. Well, Pennsylvania is in some ways fortunate with respect to the impacts of climate change, and we should recognize that we're privileged in that respect. We don't have a lot of ocean shoreline. There are some estuaries and tidal effects in the southeastern part of the state. 
but we're not facing the same challenges to sea level rise that a coastal state is like Florida, for example, or Louisiana. However, we are experiencing already many of the impacts of weather extremes that are associated with climate change. And those in the last few years, we've seen increased intensity of flooding. Pennsylvania has more miles of rivers and streams than any other state in the nation except for Alaska. Those rivers and streams are flooding at an unprecedented rate with multiple 500-year floods just in the last decades in several communities. And so these are causing serious damage to homes and to infrastructure. There's significant costs associated with that, as well as all the disruption of people being out of their homes and not able to maintain their businesses when those floods cause damage. And interestingly, although we're not an area which is thought to be particularly drought sensitive, we're also seeing that extreme as well. And again, climate change is not only one thing. In our region, it's a combination of both greater intensity of rain when it does rain, warmer winters so that snowmelt is more frequent and also contributes to flooding. But we also are having more summer droughts, periods in the summer where high temperatures and changing climate weather patterns are reducing the regularity of rainfall. And in our region, we don't have irrigation systems for the most part to support our agricultural crops. So when we have a two or three week drought in July or August, our yields of our agricultural products are reduced as well. Those are some of the economic impacts, but there are also lots of personal impacts. Pennsylvania is a state where many people care about outdoor recreation, and we're already seeing climate impacts in that respect, both in terms of shorter seasons for winter sports like, season, like skiing, but also some of our summer activities like fishing, where we have these tremendous cold water trout fisheries, including many native trout fisheries that are having trouble with the increased water temperature in the summertime. So there's just a whole host of issues that are happening that Pennsylvanians are already starting to recognize and are only going to get worse as climate change intensifies. Data show that overall, Pennsylvania is getting warmer and wetter. As Dr. Richard stated, climate change is threatening to cause statewide impacts, such as increased flooding, more heat and respiratory deaths, increased disease and pests, and disruptions to agriculture. Temperatures in Pennsylvania have increased 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit in the last century, with the expectation that the temperature will warm another 5.4 degrees by the year 2050. Precipitation has increased an average of 10%, with many places seeing a 20% increase an unexpected additional increase of 8% by 2050. Pennsylvania is also one of the top three energy production states in the nation and the top electricity exporting state. Leading in energy means that Pennsylvania also leads in emissions, responsible for nearly 1% of the world's emissions. But the state of Pennsylvania has not been silent when it comes to addressing global warming. The Pennsylvania Climate Change Act was established in 2008. The act calls for a report that is updated every three years on potential climate change impacts and economic opportunities in Pennsylvania. An inventory of greenhouse gases, a climate change action plan, and additional provisions. In January of 2019, Governor Tom Wolf issued an executive order that established a 26% reduction in statewide greenhouse gas emissions from 2005 levels by 2025, and increasing that to an 80% reduction by 2050. 
Governor Wolf is part of the U.S. Climate Alliance, a bipartisan coalition of governors committed to reducing greenhouse gas emissions consistent with the goals of the Paris Agreement. Fourteen mayors from across Pennsylvania are part of the Climate Mayors, a bipartisan peer-to-peer -peer network of U.S. mayors working together to demonstrate leadership on climate change through meaningful actions in their communities and to express and build political will for effective federal and global policy action. And there are 101 signatories from Pennsylvania, including businesses, cities, cultural institutions, faith organizations, higher education institutions, and investors that have signed the declaration and joined the coalition for We Are Still In, standing by the Paris Agreement and committed to meeting its goals. Despite all of this activity and commitment to reducing greenhouse gas emissions, a poll of 540 Pennsylvania registered voters conducted in March 2019 by Franklin and Marshall College in partnership with Pennsylvania Post showed that 68% of respondents definitely or probably want the state to do more to address climate change. In addition, more than two-thirds of the respondents, 68%, said Pennsylvania should be prioritizing the availability of renewable energy. But actions can start at the individual level. Here, Dr. Wilkinson shares how an average person can take active steps to reverse global warming. So you'll see if you crack open the pages of Drawdown or you take a look at our website at drawdown.org, we have analyzed and cataloged 100 solutions. So there's really no shortage of footholds for action for individuals and institutions around the world. I think the really important thing is to think about what are opportunities in your own life, both things you can do at home or in your community. And maybe that's something like reducing food waste or implementing composting or shifting to plant-rich diets, for example. But we also have really important opportunities to take collective action. And that's actually, I think, the most important. So what can you do professionally or in the organization that you work for or are a part of? And also, how can you engage as a citizen? So are there important efforts that are being done to actually shift policy in important ways? Are there petitions to sign, marches to attend, campaigns that you might want to support? So I think it's important to think about all of these different areas, our personal lives or our individual behavior, our professional lives and the opportunities we have there, and also how we can participate in broader collective action as citizens. There are more things than any of us could possibly do. So I really like to challenge folks to think about, you know, we have an incredibly daunting task ahead of us to transform society in the next decade. So we need everyone to play as big as they possibly can so I would say think about what your superpowers are and how you can bring those to this challenge of addressing climate change. In Pennsylvania, because of the role humans play in significantly increasing the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and ocean, changing climate patterns have caused and will continue to cause impacts to public health, infrastructure, emergency services, and major economic contributors like agriculture, tourism, and recreation. For residents of Pennsylvania, Dr. Richard has several suggestions for individual actions that can lead to reversing global warming. You'll hear that some of his ideas echo 
those shared by Dr. Wilkinson. One of the really exciting and valuable things about the drawdown analysis is it provides a broad portfolio of solutions, some of which have more relevance to certain parts of the world, and some of them have more relevance to certain people or roles of those people in society. So some things it's going to be a lot easier to do in, say, a tropical country, where there are certain kinds of things that are much more important, have a much bigger impact. Other things would make a lot of sense in the United States or in Pennsylvania. Here, I think there are also things that make sense for individuals and also things that make sense to do at more of a societal scale. For example, when we talk about forest land in Pennsylvania, most of it's in private forest, relatively small parcels. And so there are many acres of forest land, most of our acres of forest land that are owned by individuals and similarly most of our agriculture. And so those individuals that own that land can make decisions about how to manage their land to maximize the carbon benefit. But there are also businesses that are doing land management, that are building buildings, that are involved in all the sectors of the economy that are related to climate emissions. And by looking at the drawdown solutions, they can as individuals make decisions or as businesses make decisions. There are also levels of analysis and decisions and support of policies that can be done at the community level or the city level or the state level. The drawdown sectors of materials and waste, food and transportation are all areas with multiple options for individual actions that will make a difference. But there are also many, many people who want to think about and act in positive ways for the climate in their day-to-day -day lives. And I think these are a wide range of solutions for them. The most significant ones that people often overlook are in their consumer decisions, especially around food, in terms of their utilization of products, whether that's reusing materials, buying recycled products, being very thoughtful about end of life. And that's particularly true in the food system where food waste is one of the top 10 solutions. And thinking about how much food we're buying, how much we're putting on our plates, how we're handling our food waste, and whether that's actually being recycled in ways that are good for the environment, those are all options. Another really important sector for individuals is transportation and thinking about how they're moving around their communities by foot or by bicycle, by car, by carpool, by public transportation. Those are all very different and have different carbon footprints. Whether you take the time to read the Drawdown book or explore the website drawdown.org, you'll find sectors and solutions that describe initiatives to improve lives, create jobs, restore the environment, enhance security, generate resilience, and advance human health. Not all these solutions may be relevant to your situation or location, but you are guaranteed to find suggestions and learn ways to do your part to reduce greenhouse gases by avoiding emissions and or by sequestering carbon dioxide already in the atmosphere. Thanks for listening. This is Anna from Penn State Brandywine.